Let me just make sure that's uh, that's recording. Um, okay, uh, welcome to uh, the mysteries of GDPR explained with uh, GDPR with um, Egba, who um, I think are going to present the uh, the recently published uh, data protection code of conduct for betting companies. And um, after the presentation, I think they'll be taking some questions. So if you've got any um, specific issues or anything you want to cover, then please shout up. Um, just post your questions in the chat as we uh, as we go along, and then we'll get to those after the presentation. So with that, I will hand you over to uh, Dan. Yes, so uh, thanks, Martin, for the presentation. As uh, uh, you said, uh, me and Daniel will talk about the uh, EGBA code of conduct on data protection on online gambling. And uh, we will give you a couple of presentations. You can uh, always ask questions using the chat function at any time and we will answer them. So let's share my screen. Um, okay, something is wrong. One moment. Okay. Yes. Can you see the screen? Okay. Uh, yeah, we can see that now. Okay, thanks. So um, first of all, I will give you an introduction on HBA, so the European Gaming and Betting Association. We are a Brussels-based trade association which represents the uh, major online gambling and betting operators, which are established, licensed and regulated within the uh, European Union. Uh, HBA works proactively with national and European authorities and other stakeholders uh, in uh, maintaining and creating regulated online gambling markets in the countries, uh, which aim to provide both a high level of consumer protection, but also uh, consider the digital reality of today um, situation. Uh, what GBA does is therefore to advocate and uh, on behalf of the European online gaming sector on various platforms like this one on SBFC, for example, we also uh, share information on the online gambling sector, which can be information coming from the regulatory authority uh, or also uh, from our members or just news about the sector. And finally, we want to promote uh, industry cooperation and uh, leadership, uh, trying to um, bring the sector to higher standards, like for example, uh, using codes of conduct. We have this one for data protection, but we also have one on uh, responsible advertising. Uh, we have five members, which are Bet 35, Betson, GBC, Kindred, and William Hill, uh, which Daniel is part of. And our members have licenses in uh, uh, 20 European countries uh, and account for a total of 16.5 million customers. Uh, combined, they represent 25% of the European online sector. Now, some background on uh, our code. Uh, the code has been prepared in accordance with Article 40 of the GDPR. This article states that uh, uh, national authorities, uh, the European Data Protection Board, uh, the European Commission, uh, shall encourage the drafting and using of sectoral codes of conduct to support the proper application of the GDPR. Um, because of this, uh, we had this idea as a responsibility initiative of the sector to uh, improve data protection standards and to bring them to um, a certain level for all the sector. So we decided to draft uh, this code. To do this, we created a working group uh, um, composed by the data protection officers and uh, their teams of the EGBA members. Um, and also on the draft code, we had a public consultation that went to uh, January and February of this year. And after the comments received by uh, stakeholders interested, we also carried out an in 
independent third-party uh, review of the code by a law firm. And then we submit, uh, we publish the code. Uh, first of all, for the scope, uh, the code applies to all EGBA members currently, and it's open to the adherence of any other online gambling operator. Uh, it will cover all the processing of personal data of players in the online gambling sector, but it doesn't cover the company employee relationship uh, in the company themselves, and it doesn't cover any offline activities. And of course, the code, when approved, will be uh, legally binding for all the European and uh, EA countries, uh, of course, always for the signatories. But it's possible for any online gambling company that is not part of the EA, for example, now in the UK, to uh, nonetheless adhere to our code. Uh, to adhere, um, I wish we said any other gambling operators, no member of EGBA can adhere uh, upon an administration fee that will be used to cover the monitoring costs of the code because the code needs an independent third party monitoring body uh, to be enforced. We'll come back to this later. And at EGBA, we also invited national gambling associations to endorse the code and to encourage their members to sign up to it. For now, the Dutch Association uh, did it already. And finally, it has to be considered that the code is not a fixed document, but uh, a living one, and will be further developed over time, uh, both because of possible legislative and technological developments in the data protection framework, but also because um, when we go to apply the code in practice, we can see that maybe there are certain problems arising. As you may know, adhering to a code of conduct uh, that has been approved per the GDPR, um, it's helpful in demonstrating the company's compliance uh, uh, with the GDPR itself, and it's taken into account by the data protection authorities when they decide to enforce uh, uh, actions or sanctions for breaching the GDPR. So it's already useful uh, in this way for companies. And it also has three objectives. The first one is to provide guidance to uh, gambling companies on how to apply the GDPR. This is because any uh, country has different uh, gambling laws, different licensing requirements, which sometimes may collide with the GDPR so uh, this can be uh, some useful guidance. Another objective is to um, help uh, customers trust against the use of their data and to improve transparency on how their data is used because we know from the media that when a company uh, loses the data or there is a breach of personal data uh, of their customers, they first uh, take a reputational hit even before the financial one. And finally, this is a pan-European initiative that tries to assist uh, online gambling companies in achieving a harmonized application of the GDPR, uh, always taking into account the specificities of the online gambling sector, as it's already uh, one of the aim of the GDPR itself. Now with the approval process, uh, we submitted this code in June to the Maltese Data Protection Authority, which is called the uh, Office for Information and Data Protection Commissioner, uh, for its formal approval. Uh, we decided to submit the code to the Maltese because this code is a transnational one, because it will be applied in multiple member states. So the approval process is a bit more uh, um, complicated. Um, first of all, a maximum of two other data protection authorities will uh, assist and co-review, assist the IDPC and co-review the code with them. Um, after this, uh, the IDPC will submit the code to the European Data Protection Board, uh, which is the European body that deals with data protection at the European level. This body will issue an opinion saying whether this code uh, um, complies with the GDPR and can be approved. And finally, the uh, Maltese authority will take into account this opinion and decide whether uh, the code will be approved or not. Uh, this process 
is uh, estimated to last 18 to 24 months, but we don't really know. It depends from uh, the workload of the Maltese and the other data protection authorities on uh, if we have to redraft certain parts of the code or if, for example, uh, like uh, now, let's say the code is not high priority because of the coronavirus and maybe other related issues. Finally, for the monitoring and enforcement, as I said before, we need a third party monitoring body. The code contains in itself uh, some clear requirements which are mandatory for the signatories and some best practice requirements which are not mandatory. This is because when drafting the code, we have to take into account the uh, possibilities of small and medium operators to uh, join the code. So we decided to put uh, the strict test requirement uh, as something not mandatory because we didn't want to um, create problems and hinder the possibilities for other operators to join the code and maybe they would need to implement some costly um, some costly things to um, comply with the code. The monitoring of the compliance, so with these requirements, will be assigned to this uh, uh, independent third party monitoring body. We are in contact with one, and this will need to be accredited uh, by the Maltese Data Protection Authority and certified. After the code will be approved, uh, it will be legally binding and so enforced um, against its signatories. Um, this concludes my part of the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, we can take them later. Otherwise, we can go on with uh, Daniel's uh, presentation. Okay, thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen first. Oh, it won't let me. The host has disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, so I can share yours for you. One moment. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Voila, can you see it? Yes. Voila. Okay, um, very briefly, because um, we're trying to leave as much room as we can for questions at the end. Can you go back, Daniel? Yes. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Daniel Chapman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm currently the DPO for William Hill International uh, and Mr. Green, uh, both of which form part of the overall uh, William Hill Group, which you'll be more familiar with, possibly depending on where you are in the world than those other two brands. I've done this for 20 years. I enjoy doing it. I don't want to do anything else. And when I had the opportunity to work with Egbert on this code, I, I jumped at it because I really think it's worthwhile. And that's what I'm going to try and, and talk to you about today. Um, the last thing I'll say before getting into it is a standard disclaimer. I'm here today as myself. Nothing I say is representative of the opinions uh, or intentions of my company. I have to say that. Um, so there we are, it's said. Next slide, sir. I'm not going to read each slide to you because by the time I get through one bullet point, you've already scanned the whole document. But what I am going to do is just pick out something on each slide that I think is particularly important or good about what the code is doing. And I'm going to jump straight in with a contentious issue. The first bullet point, data maps. Yes, it's true. I can't point at a, at a section of the GDPR that mandates data maps. It isn't there. However, we took the opinion when we were building the code that a lot of things recommend having one. And it makes common sense because if you don't know what data you've got and you don't know where that data is, then you can't possibly conduct a satisfactory, satisfactory risk assessment on that data. And we all know the nightmare situation. It really happens. There's a server in a cupboard, which is still on, and nobody even remembers it's there. 
a filing cabinet that gets discovered um, and it's full of personal data, maybe HR files. So doing the data map encourages people to dig these things out and document them and maybe destroy half of them that have been there for a hundred years for no purpose. So it, you can also use it to help you purge those old files. What the code doesn't do, although it mandates having one, is tell you how complicated it must be, what tools to use. It doesn't mandate some fancy thing which is going to be beyond the reach of most companies to buy. This could be anything from an Excel spreadsheet to an access database to one of those fancy tools. It's up to you to decide how granular it is, how big it is, and to what level of detail it needs to go. As long as you can hand on heart say, we know what data we've got and where it is, then that's the end goal here. Next slide, please. And talking about the end goal, it's really important to think of it like that because what this code is, is a common destination. We're all going to get there in different ways. As long as those ways are compliant with the code, and as Danielle said, we've left room for different solutions with different budgets, et cetera, et cetera. As long as we all take that journey and arrive at that same place, that's what's important. The journey will only ever be assessed based on the realities of the member company that's being assessed at that moment. You'll never be compared to anybody else or what somebody else did. On this slide, I just want to pick out data portability, an issue that's relatively simple on the surface. But when we were throwing ideas about around how we would make portability work, what came out was that one operator would never want from, from the sender, if you like, the receiver would never want all of the information that the sender would have to disclose under data portability. And that creates two problems. The, the operator sending the data would have spent time, money, resources in gathering all of that information. And the receiver is now faced with having a lot of information that they won't use, didn't want, didn't ask for, but now it's their responsibility to get rid of it in a secure manner. So what we're proposing, and it will be doable if the code is approved, um, is that with the customer's consent, one operator can talk directly to the other operator where the customer would like their data to go and figure out the most efficient way to get that done. So we're only sending the data that the other party wants to receive. Saves us time, saves their problem of having data they don't want. It all gets done faster for the customer. So everybody wins and yet we're achieving what the customer wants to achieve. So it's a slight twist on the technically precise interpretation of the portability right. We're not taking that away from the customer. They still have that if they want it, but we're trying to get to what the benefit is in that right for the customer in a better way. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On this slide, I want to talk about the DPAs, the relationship of the data protection authorities or supervisory authorities. In the code, we've been quite bold around this. The GDPR and even the guidance documents from the European Data Protection Board they talk about the concept of a one-stop shop. So nominating a lead supervisory authority through which the complaints will be handled and, and who you develop the closest relationship with. But at no point do they really lay out any mandatory rules about that. So you don't have to do it. You don't have to document it. You don't have to publicize it. Um, and our view was, was no, we'd, we'd like to be more granular than that. So what, what we've said is that you do have to pick one. If, if you're a multinational throughout Europe company, you have to pick where your main establishment is. You have to use that to choose your lead supervisory authority, data protection authority, and you must document that. 
we haven't said you have to publish it, but internally, at the very least, it must be documented to prove that it's been decided. And the thinking behind that is that it, it's all about customer trust. It would prevent jurisdiction shopping. So the moment you do this, you decide it, you write it down, it's mandatory. You can't push any court case around the world until you hit a jurisdiction that suits your purposes. Um, we've all heard of major multinationals doing this. So this is one of the elements, one of the, the tiny bits of it, which build up to make a picture where we're trying to say, trust us with your data. We're prepared to be open, transparent. We're not trying to play clever with any of this. Next slide. I'm not going to talk about these at all. I'm going to leave them there so you can see them. I'm going to talk about the idea behind putting them in the code. The reason for that is I want you to read the code. Um, if I talk through these case studies, you won't have to. But the idea of these case studies is they're sector specific. They were created by a group of operators for a group of operators. They are the problems that we all said we face every day. They are the areas of the act that we all said were difficult to interpret. Um, so we tried to fix that. We tried to actually give you a document you could pick up and heaven forbid, you might actually find an answer to your question, as opposed to a case study about a mechanic, which you then have to try and apply to profiling risky gambling behavior. Here are some more ones, problem areas, direct marketing, fraud detection and the use of um, automated decision-making versus solely automated decision-making, all mixed together with the concept of how transparent can you be about that? Because being transparent, which we have to be by law, would defeat the purpose because people would then learn to circumvent it. So take that whole mess and try and work through it. And, and that's the kind of case study that you'll you'll find in the code. Um, and that that's it. That's as much as I want to say, because uh, I'm here for your questions. Um, this is me. Feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's absolutely fine. I'll always respond. And please read the code. I do think you'll find it worth your while. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Dan. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, if they, if you just want to post them in the uh, the chat for the moment, um, there was one thing that I um, jumped, jumped out to me when you were uh, running through those uh, slides, Dan. Um, there was a reference to automated decision making and profiling in there. Yes. I was just wondering if uh, perhaps it's because I don't work for an operator, so I'm not entirely sure. Well, that refers to but could you just sort of outline what what that is absolutely um there are many examples of it but i think if i choose the <clears throat> most complicated one um because that that's a good example of it and why it isn't straightforward it would be identifying risky gambling behavior so our systems all operators systems to a different degree and in different ways monitor what people are doing and make decisions about is the pattern changing? Has this person only ever bet five pounds, 10 pounds before, and now they're suddenly betting far more frequently and, and higher amounts? Because that could be an indicator the person is in trouble, the person is developing an issue. Um, and we want to head that off for, for the customer, for ourselves, because we have to by law. So for a million reasons, we want early intervention in something like that. And the way to do that is to have the computer make a decision, to, to spot it for us and flag it up. Now, different people handle it in different ways. Automated decision-making would be where that flag goes to a human who then reviews the computer's thoughts and says yes or no, or maybe decides a third way. Solely automated decision-making would be where the computer identifies a problem and rightly or wrongly, restricts the player's account. Okay. Um, so they're, they're very different and, and have different consequences, obviously. 
Okay, and is the <clears throat> is there then a uh, a right for the player to see that information, or why the decision making was the decision was taken? Or um, there is for solely automated decision making, and this is one of the very important differences. Uh, under solely automated decision making, there's a right for the person to see the logic behind the decision and require that a human being reviews it and comes to their own decision. But if yep. the human being is already involved, then they don't have those rights, including the right to see the logic. Right. Okay. And do, do operators then have to um, display some information like that in a privacy policy <clears throat> or in terms and conditions somewhere to, to let people know how they're being assessed? It's one of the problem areas with transparency. And um, it's, it's where the urge to be transparent, which is right and just, and I completely understand it, uh, bangs its head against the fact that being transparency would, sorry, the fact that being transparent, if you went too far, would enable people to circumvent the system. Yes. Yeah, I can say and, that. And then you've got a public good situation. So, and this is the case with, with the GDPR in so many ways, it just completely butts heads against another piece of legislation and you're forced to decide which law you break. Um, so yeah, everyone decides differently, but what you end up with is weighing the need for to be as transparent as you possibly can be with the public good of problem gambling. Sure, sure, okay. So um, I just wonder when you were um, working on, on this code and pulling it together, were there uh, specific sort of uh, issues you had in mind from your own role with William Hill, things that had come up that you really wanted to tackle, you know, the particular issues that come up again and again? Yes, absolutely. Um, and the one we've just discussed is, is one of them, is profiling right. uh, mm -hmm. is, a, is a big one. Um, marketing is always big. And I don't, th don't think these are anything really to do with William Hill or even the sector. I think any large company with a lot of customers would give you the same list. Mm -hmm. um, any big company wants to market to as many people as they can. Um, they'd absolutely love to find a way to market to people who've opted out, um, but they can't. Um, and so there is always a temptation to try and find a clever way around something. And what we wanted with the code was to try and cut those off to a large degree and say, no, that doesn't send the message that you can be trusted. And this code is all about you can trust us. So okay. don't try and find a clever way around the problem. This is how you apply the law in case in many places, the GDPR is not clear on how to do that. Um, so do this, do this in your own way, but do this. And those, those are two of the big ones, marketing, profiling, um, were easily the biggest responding to subject access requests was another one. It's another area. What do you give? What do you hold back? What would giving something compromise? Um, you've got the tipping off exemption, you've got all sorts of things. So that got quite a lot of discussion of, of how do you make a decision when each decision has to be on an individual basis. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. I don't know if anyone else has got any, any questions this time. Here we go. Um, I don't know if you can see the questions or not, Dan, but I'll, I'll read it out in case people can't. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the presentation that adherence to a sectoral code, code is taken into account by a data protection authority if a gambling company is found to be in breach of GDPR. Uh, so the question is, uh, what would what would taken into account mean exactly? And how would that be applied in practice by the DPA? Yeah, I'll get this uh, if you want. Um, so basically in this case, taken into account would mean, uh, as you know, from the power that the data protection authorities have, there are fines, which is I think the most scary for um, companies. Um, and uh, the amount of these fines can be very high. 
uh, even to up to a certain millions of euros, especially with gambling companies that have a high turnover um, to be interested in this. But uh, anyway, taking into account will mean that the Data Protection Authority, since that company adheres to an approved code of conduct already, um, let's say, believes that this company is much more compliant with the GDPR as a company which is not adhering to this code of conduct and like monitored because of this. But also they can decide to um, take into account can mean also uh, reduce the fines that could be issued to the company. I don't know if, ben, if Daniel wants to complete uh, or you have any other things to say about this? Oh, no, I would, I would just say that it's a, mit it's a mitigating factor in the same way they can take into account how cooperative you were, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's all it is. Okay. So it's about you, you get, you're getting some credit for the fact you can show you've been trying to do the right thing, but have um, made a mistake somewhere along the line. Absolutely. And will have been audited and tested as part of the code. So they know you're actually, to use a phrase I dislike, walking the walk um, because you've passed previous audits. So it, it all goes to explain that this is a one-time issue, slip up, blip, in which case I'll handle it very differently. Yeah. Okay. And I've got another question from uh, Margot, which is regarding uh, subject access requests. Um, often customers ask for the notes made on their account by the operator. Could you please describe if any notes on the client's profile, such as AML, um, responsible gambling, should be disclosed to the player? And in what cases and how can we refuse to disclose the information? Oh, a very complicated and very specific question, but I have to say I did half expect it. Um, <clears throat> it's been asked because it's a difficult one. I mean, there's no point me me saying really how and why it's difficult it is. We don't want to give the data because it, it would begin to affect the efficacy of those systems. Um, and it comes back to that point really, that you do have to weigh up. And sometimes the decision is not risk-free uh, because of the fact that the GDPR just butts heads with other legislation. So sometimes you are making a risk-based decision and maybe partly a decision based upon the moral and ethical values of the company about wh which way you want to fall on the public good argument. Um, there is case law. I won't try and remember it off the top of my head because I'll get it wrong. Um, but there is case law, a couple of cases in Germany, a couple from other places where it has been decided that notes in this context do not have to be shared. Now, I should say, if you don't share them, you're making use of an exemption, one way or another, whether it be the tipping off exemption or anything else you're using, a public good exemption. And those have to be applied narrowly, and they have to be applied specifically to each piece of information. So what you don't get from using those exemptions is, is carte blanche to say you're not getting any notes. Um, you can only hold back or redact the ones that would prejudice the effectiveness. But one thing which is less commonly known, the tipping off exemption people are used to when you're talking about police investigations. So you don't have to reveal that you just sent all this data to the police last week. But it can also be applied to a process. If in revealing the information, you would tip people in general off to how the process operates and thereby reduce its effectiveness. Uh, and, and the ICO themselves have, have discussed this. Um, so not everyone is familiar with that use and it is one to consider in this situation for those very reasons. Okay. So when you get um, a, request, a request like that, is it a case of um, do you deal with those sort of things in or would you recommend operators would deal with that kind of thing internally? Or is there some kind of um, advice available that they would need to take? 
There's always the ICO. Um, I get on very well with them. And um, I say ICO because I've only recently moved to Malta. I'm used to dealing with the ICO. Yeah. Um, but all regulators, I'm sure, in my experience, and certainly the ICO, is very approachable. Um, they answer questions. I've even asked questions which stumped them a couple of times, and they've had to go away and come back to me the next day. But they always do. So there are those. There are external DPO services. You could outsource the whole thing if that's how you wanted to play it. Um, or do it internally. It all depends on your resources. Not everybody can afford a full-time DPO who does nothing else and therefore has the time to become an expert in every aspect of it. And so it, if you're not that lucky, then I do think you'll be supplementing with external advice. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, I don't know if anyone else has got any questions at this stage or, uh, and just a, a note, one of the things we normally do in these sessions is just encourage people to uh, swap contact details in the uh, in the chat, whether that just be a, um, a LinkedIn, uh, a link to your LinkedIn profile so people can connect or, you know, um, are we allowed to encourage people to uh, swap uh, email addresses in a public forum? <laughs> If they do it by themselves, I think that's uh, an example of consent. I think we can go with that. Right. Okay. No problems. Um, and if people want to um, perhaps get in touch with uh, with either you or or uh, Daniele, um, LinkedIn or just maybe. Um, well, I'm. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'm certainly. Yeah, I'm certainly available. Um, probably LinkedIn better for me than my uh, company mailbox, but uh, that's fine. If you find me on LinkedIn, I'm just desperately trying to post my link now. But right, course, okay. the internet is frozen as ever when you really want it. Yes. Yeah, that's a familiar problem to uh, everyone who's been stuck working at home for the last uh, <laughs> last six months or so, I think. Um, um, actually, just had an, another question as well. Um, are there any meetings for DPOs across the industry um, that they can join? And uh, if not, do you plan to start to start um, one so that um, um, people, people can get together and share their experiences? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as far as I know, uh, no, but Daniel may know something more. But uh, we were considering, we are considering a TGBA at like having uh, more another workshop like this maybe that goes a bit more into detail uh, what with the audience that will be just data protection officers so like uh, expert people and uh, I guess maybe uh, Daniel in one of these will be present to be the expert because he is <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah we can uh, we can share contact and, and uh, we can update you if you are interested Exactly. I'm not aware of any, not in our industry. I'm aware of some in other industries because uh, not long ago I was a DPO for a company which crossed many sectors. Uh, and oddly, of the, all the sectors they crossed, it was our sector that didn't have such a group. Which uh, I suppose slightly strange given the uh, vast amount of customer data that um, major operators must have to to deal with. So. I, I did find it strange. Um, in some ways, I guess our industry is still relatively young compared to some others. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that interoperator trust isn't, isn't quite there yet. Um, that was my assumption. I have nothing but my own mind to back that up. But it just felt like maybe people weren't, companies rather, weren't ready to get in the same room and discuss problems quite yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think if we don't have any more audience questions at this stage, um, perhaps we can bring things to a close. So thank you very much to both of you. That was a um, really interesting session. And um, as we've touched on already, if people need some further information, um, they can get in touch with either of you two. And also believe 
um, see if we can find the link to it now. The, there's a copy of the code of conduct that they can download from the EGBA website, is that right? Yes, uh, on the EGBA website, there is the code of conduct. I can share a link, uh, but it's like uh, kind of easy to find the one to the link. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's great. Barry's just uh, posted that in the uh, in the chat for anyone. So that's brilliant. So uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and talking to us about this, and um, thank you to everyone else for uh, listening and asking questions. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Bye, Barry.